Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about the books that I have recently read, and I've got two of them to talk about today. I've got Norman F. Cantor's Antiquity, and Thomas De Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, uh, as well as a couple other works um, from this Oxford World Classics. Uh, so first, I'll talk about Antiquity. Uh, I read this early in January. This was my first selection for Historathon. Um, Historathon, uh, for those who don't know yet, is a year-long reading event where we are celebrating and reading and talking about uh, historical nonfiction. Uh, it's an event that I'm spearheading, but I'm accompanied by some really great co-hosts. I'll have all of their information and all the information for the event linked down below. Uh, but essentially, we have split the year up into four quarters, um, and each quarter focuses on a different time period or a time span. So the first three months, the first quarter, is reading books about the history from prehistory up until 500 CE. Uh, so you can pretty much read anything that has to do with that that time frame um, from any location. So I am sticking to books that I've had on my shelves because I am also taking part in the Read What You Own Challenge that Criminali had uh, come up with. Um, essentially, um, read, you know, you, you set yourself however many books you're going to read that you already own before you start buying new books. Uh, so I set my limit or my, you know, my goal at 50. I want to read 50 books that I already have and some of you have had for years, including this one. Um, so that's what I'm pulling for for my Historathon uh, reading, um, with a couple of, of exceptions. You, you can't really see it behind me, but uh, I do allow myself the exception of picking up about a book a month for reading events or buddy reads, um, but that's about it. Uh, no big book hauls from like used bookstores or anything. And this one has been on my shelf for a long time. I remember buying this, I think I bought this at Borders uh, many years ago, and I know that I started it. Uh, I probably got to maybe like 30 or 40 pages in, and for whatever reason, I I just didn't finish it. Um, so this was one that I definitely wanted to uh, prioritize for Historathon. And Norman F. Cantor, this is the first thing I've read by him. I know that his book on the Black Plague is uh, is quite popular, and he's got some, as far as a popular historian is concerned, um, he was at least uh, a pretty well-known name. And this one came, I think, like a pretty, shortly before he died. Uh, this came out in 2003. I think he passed away maybe a year or so after that. Um, it could be a little bit sort of wrong there, but I don't think he lived too much longer after this. And um, <clears throat> you know, I didn't know what to expect, uh, but the subtitle, From the Birth of Sumerian Civilization to the Fall of the Roman Empire, made me believe that we were going to get stuff all, going all the way back to really the dawn of history, uh, all the way up through, of course, the fall of the Roman Empire. And we kind of get that, but not exactly. Uh, Cantor has a strange structure for this um, book. He splits it up into two different sections. And the first section is really short. Um, he calls it basic narrative. And he has these chapters, sometimes they're only like maybe four pages or four or five pages, um, where he gives kind of a, a brief overall, you know, nuts and bolts narrative of um of who the Romans were, who the Christians were, the classical heritage. You got four four worldviews from antiquity, and unfortunately, you know the very first chapter there is hydraulic be hydraulic despotisms, which is only a few pages, and that's where we end up seeing Sumerian civilization. I was really hoping we were going to get more about like Mesopotamia and Babylon, you know, all that stuff. Um, but really, like Sumeria gets a, a paragraph maybe inside that um, that first chapter, and that's it. Uh, we don't get much at all from uh, the real ancient Near East. Um, so we get this kind of very basic outline, which isn't always the most exciting thing to read. Um, it's, you know, I guess if it's new information to you, um, it's important stuff, but uh, it's not the most engaging. And then he goes into a much, in you know, the second half of the book, um, the chapters are much longer. And they dive a little more into depth and things. And he calls that societies and cultures. And uh, there he finally at least has a chapter on Egypt and also one on ancient Judaism. So we do get some of the ancient Near East. Again, not Samaria, but we get something. Uh, the Egyptian chapter is okay. Um, I found the ancient Judaism chapter quite fascinating. 
Uh, but of course, it's not a subject that I know uh, a great deal about at all. Um, you know, he gets into uh, you know some of the history behind uh, what you know, the creation of the Bible, and um, he he doesn't really have a any problem with um, contradicting biblical narrative in this. Uh, then he has a chapter on Athens, which I thought was pretty decent. Uh, Rome was all right. Uh, Christian thought, um, which I thought was that was actually kind of interesting. Uh, he focuses on Saint Augustine. In Christian thought. And he says that he wanted to make it more interesting to the reader. So what he does is he creates a fake um, dialogue between St. Augustine and basically another prominent Christian of his era in order to uh, showcase kind of what St. Augustine, what his beliefs were, um, the kind of the birth of what we would consider Catholicism there, uh, or how it was growing at that time at least, and um, the kind of rival Christianities that were around at the time. And, you know, as somebody who only has a very cursory knowledge of Augustine, that I found that chapter helpful. Um, then he follows it up with a chapter called The Civil Law, which, if you want to make things engaging, I don't know if that's how I would kind of end my book. I mean, it's pretty much how we end it. He has a little short chapter about remembering antiquity, but really the, the crux of the ending is civil law in it. He talks a little bit about Cicero, and then he goes into the kind of medieval and modern heritage of Roman law which is no doubt important as far as history is concerned, but it's not the most engaging thing to leave a beginning reader with <laughs> on the era. Uh, so it's kind of weird to follow up a dialogue about Augustine because you don't want your audience to get bored and then say, hey, want to talk about law for, you know, uh, the legacy of law for 20-something pages? Um, you know, I <clears throat> I know that some people watch my channel are lawyers. Uh, maybe, maybe they'll have... A better time with that chapter. Uh, so this is a little bit of a, this is kind of a mixed bag for me. Um, some chapters were engaging, some of them were kind of dull and boring. It feels like, and I don't know how he created this, but it feels like he had a bunch of kind of like essays and short writings uh, that all kind of dealt with the ancient world and it kind of got cobbled together as a single piece. Um, it has a little bit of that, that patchwork quality feel to it. Um, if somebody knows nothing about antiquity, I think they would definitely come away understanding a lot more about that era. Uh, but if you're somebody who already knows some of that stuff, um, I don't know if you're going to get much out of this, honestly. Um, so, yeah, it, it, people's mileage will vary with this. Um, but anyway, I was glad I read it. Uh, the other thing that I read, like I said, was Thomas de Quincey, Confessions of an English Opium Eater and Other Writings. Um, this is actually three works. Um, now, I had read this as part of my kind of informal gothic book club that I have with some uh, other booktubers and some, uh, some uh, subscribers. We're a small group, um, but each month or so, sometimes we're skipping a month here and there, we are kind of going through gothic literature in chronological order. And De Quincey is not exactly a gothic writer, but he is somebody who heavily influenced gothic writers, especially people like Edgar Allan Poe they associated him with the Gothic because he wrote about drug addiction and uh, the kinds of things that he would see basically when he's high and his nightmares. And um, he was very good at writing about these dreams. And some of them are very dark, uh, some, you know, more creepy stuff. So he's got three works in here. He's got The Confessions of an English Opium Meter, which was 1821. Uh, he's got Suspiria de Profundis, which is what ended up inspiring Dario Argento to make his horror films, uh, Suspiria, uh, Tenebre, and I think it was the last one, Mother of Tears, maybe? Which is a pretty forgettable film, so I, I might be forgetting that title on purpose. Uh, the other two are much better. Um, and then the last one is more like a, it's more like a, a short essay, uh, well, not short, but it's an essay, uh, The English Mail Coach from 1849. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about each of these things. Uh, the first one, Confessions, he's still fairly young when he's writing that in 1821, and he is, they didn't have the word addiction really back then. Uh, they didn't have the same understanding of it that we have. You know, they would have seen people who couldn't stop taking drugs as like a, something of a moral failure. Um, so <clears throat> De Quincey was kind of taking a risk in talking about things like this. So he recounts when he's a young man, uh, he runs away from school, and he kind of lives as like a, he's just homeless, and he's a drifter. And um, he talks about his experiences there, because they kind of play into the things that he would end up seeing and kind of hallucinating about in his uh, in his opium, you know, highs, and in his nightmares that he would end up having. Uh, 
he talks about like a, a, a girl that he knew that he'd never see again. Um, so various things. Uh, and then he talks about how he got basically hooked on opium. And then he talks about the highs of opium, uh, the kind of euphoria, the uh, expansion of time and space that seems to happen inside his mind. And then he ends it with the the downside, the nightmares, basically, of opium. I don't remember exactly how he phrases it. Uh, but these are like the more horrific images that he would see and things that he would be afraid of. Um, and we see a lot of the the strange... Um, he's, he's a real xenophobe. Um, and uh, it kind of comes out in weird ways. He talks at one point in in his... Uh, when he is... before he's high. Uh, it, he talks about how a Malay, I guess a, an Asian gentleman, um, shows up at the door. I guess he, he was kind of like hiking. He, I think De Quincey was living in the mountains at this point. So this guy shows up at the door. He's just kind of looking for some food um, as he's hiking up the mountain. And uh, because De Quincey doesn't know uh, any Asian languages, he decides to try and like recite the Iliad to him in, in Greek. Uh, it's just weird. Um, but he, he has a real fear of outsiders, which isn't entirely you know, atypical for his time period, but it's pretty strong with him. And uh, it comes about in his, it affects his nightmares he ends up having from the, the opium, which is kind of interesting. Um, I'll come back to his, his whole Greek thing in a moment. Uh, because we do get to, um, after that, and I, I would recommend, I, I thought that Confessions of an English Opium Eater was actually quite interesting. Uh, his follow-up to that, um, that once again returns to the opium um, effects, is something that he wrote over 20 years later, Suspiria de Profundis, which I think means um, like a deep size or something. Um, and he recounts uh, early childhood trauma with death, um, especially with his his sister, who I think was maybe two years older than him. He was maybe around six when she was eight. And her kind of sudden death and talks about going into uh, her bedroom uh, when nobody knows that he's there and, you know, he's viewing her dead body. And um, the effect that had. And there, there's some really good writing there. Um, the problem with De Quincey is that he gets so verbose at times that he hits you with something that can be very powerful, but then he just doesn't know when to stop and put the brakes on it. And you're just kind of numb by the end of it. Uh, he just takes too long sometimes to get through stuff. He's a little bit too self-indulgent, uh, I think, with his writing. Um, and also, he likes to remind you over and over again that he knows Greek. Um, he talks about in Confessions of an English Opium Eater that he was very talented at a young age at, at reading Greek. Um, and he never misses an opportunity to make some kind of allusion to ancient Greece or Greek myth. And even when it does, it's not really called for, it doesn't need it. Uh, you just, it's just like, you know, you just kind of feel like, get over yourself, man. We get it. We know that you know this stuff. Um, so he can kind of become, he comes off as pompous to me in a lot of ways. Uh, and that can, can irk me. Um, but I thought that the stuff about his sister dying was very good. And, you know, when he doesn't beat it to death, um, I don't mean it, you know, the double death there. Uh, but he, he can go on and on. But there are moments that are really good in that. And that's when he talks about also the, he gets into it. It's a very short section, actually, about the uh, the three sisters, or three mothers, I should say. Three mothers. And that what was what inspired Dario Argento. I think it was the mother of darkness, the mother of sighs, and mother of tears. And um, it's a very beautiful passage, actually. It's really good. I, I recommend reading that. You don't have to read the rest of, honestly, Suspiria de Profundis. Um, but I would read that small section. I like that. And then he follows it up with an, the English mail coach. And he recounts when he was um, a student, I think it's a student at Oxford, maybe, um, and they would ride on top of the English mail coaches. So these are, you know, large coach wagons. Um, I guess I, I guess they were allowed to do this and they would like pay a fee. And it was kind of like public transportation. They would jump on these wagons and, you know, they'd be able to ride them for a while. But they weren't like, they weren't safe. You know, you were basically, you know, in with a bunch of, uh, bunch of mail. Um, but he was riding these things uh, back and forth um, during the time of the Napoleonic Wars. So these coaches were also bringing news of the war. And he talked about how exciting it was when they, England had all these victories. And uh, they would basically have, like, these laurels on the on the carriage. And um, it, that was kind of an interesting little slice of, you know, early 19th century English life there. Uh, and then he recounts how one of his coach drivers, this, uh, this one-eyed guy, ends up falling asleep um, while riding, driving the horses. And they end up crashing into another carriage. And he witnesses somebody killed during that time. 
And you would think that this would be like a really profound thing, but once again, he is just so verbose. He doesn't know when to stop. Um, you know, he, <laughs> it's just, he, he kind of exhausts you because uh, he, he can't stop talking about certain things. So I, I kind of actually liked the stuff about the Napoleonic War section. I thought that was more interesting than actually the crash that happens. I think it's called like the dream fugue of sudden death or something that he calls it. That a real thing that he witnessed, but it's just too much um, <laughs> the way that he writes. So what I, what I recommend to Quincy, I, I would recommend things of him in small doses. Like I said, Eng Confessions of an English Opium Eater is very interesting, especially as a little time capsule from 1921. Uh, that one section about the three mothers and Suspiriti Profundus, I think that's worth reading. And at least the first part of the mail co English Mail Coach, when he's talking about writing during the Napoleonic War, um, I think that stuff is pretty interesting too. But there's there's whole chunks of this that my eyes were just kind of glazing over um, reading. So I would not recommend all of these to the casual reader. Just read it in chunks and in different pieces. So anyway, those are the two things that I read. Uh, we've got Antiquity by Norman F. Cantor, and this is for Historathon. And then to look more into the influence on Gothic literature, not necessarily Gothic literature, but the influence uh, upon it, I read Thomas de Quincey and some of his works from the early 19th century. So if you read any of these, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as always, thank you, BookTube.